It's been six months since the start of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Millions of Ukrainians have fled the country. Thousands more have died. And Russia has captured and occupied parts of the country. Keith Darden is an associate professor in the School of International Service at American University. Keith, welcome to the program. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me on. This was not supposed to last this long. Are you surprised that the war has dragged on for six months? I'm surprised and I'm not surprised. Uh, I think this war could have gone one of two ways. It could have been a two-month war or a multi-year war. And I think it was pretty clear after the first few weeks that we were moving into that multi-year, long, protracted conflict scenario, uh, which is where we find ourselves now. Well, some analysts are saying that the war is at an operational standstill. Do you agree with that? I think that's right. I think that both forces are exhausted. Uh, so it's very difficult to mount uh, an offensive at this point with the forces that they have. So you have a lot of efforts to resupply on both sides and an artillery war that's designed to limit those resupply efforts. And so we're really moving into a, a you know, a excruciatingly painful, long, exhausting conflict with very little territorial movement kind of on the lines of World War One. Well, speaking of resupply, the recently the U.S. has pledged to send more anti-armor rounds, mine-resistant vehicles, and for the first time, drones. Do you think this will make a difference? I think it'll make a difference in limiting the Russian capacity su to supply the front line. So I think it'll be very important for preventing further Russian offensives particularly in the southern part of the country. In other words, I think it's going to make it very difficult for the Russians to reach Odessa and to take the city of Mykolaiv. Uh, if you, you know, those are long supply lines that are quite spread out. Uh, and if the Ukrainians can strike deeper into Russian territory uh, with switchblade drones or long distance, uh, very accurate artillery, it's going to make it very hard for the Russians to move anything forward to those front lines in a concentration that would allow them to to take some territory again. So I do think it's very important. So another concern is the fighting at the nuclear power plant in Ukraine. It's it's Europe's largest. Uh, both sides are accusing each other of, you know, threatening nuclear terrorism. What What's your assessment of what's going on there? That one's a little bit hard to unpack. I think one of the key features of warfare is always the manipulation of information, and both sides are doing that quite a bit. I think the Russians control that nuclear power plant. So the likelihood that they're shelling that nuclear power plant is, uh, let's just say it's remote. I don't think they're shelling their own positions, but they are using it as a kind of shield from which to attack Ukrainian forces on the other side of the Dnieper River. Uh, so Energodar, the nuclear power plant, is located in a very strategic location uh, on one side of that river. And so if the Russians can shell Ukrainian forces uh, and protect themselves from Ukrainian strikes, the nuclear power plant provides a kind of human shield or nuclear shield for them. Uh, and the Ukrainians obviously don't want to let them do that. Uh, so they're shelling very close to that nuclear power plant. It's very dangerous. There has always been calls for negotiations between the two sides. Is there a diplomatic solution? And, and is that possible at this point? There's not a diplomatic solution now because both sides believe that they can do better than they're currently doing. Uh, the Ukrainians believe that they can slowly shut down and take away Russian uh, capability uh, to move forward. And just like the Russians retreated around Kiev, uh, they think that they might get the Russians to retreat in the south and east of the country if they don't feel like they can protect those forces and supply those forces, they might just pull them back. And so I do think that, and the Russians are committed to this for the long term. Uh, this is a very important fight for them. Uh, they put a lot of weight uh, on the importance of incorporating these parts of Ukraine uh, and overthrowing the Kiev government. And they have not backed off that for one for one minute. You know, there was an expectation that economic sanctions against Russia would would have forced Putin to change his calculus. What impact do you think they've had, if any? I think they have a, a long range impact. So if it diminishes the Russian capability to produce, you know, accurate long range strike capabilities, like, you know, some of their missiles are being depleted. Uh, if they're not able to get semiconductors uh, because access to that is now restricted through sanctions, that's going to limit their capacity long term. But I think 
you know, the Russians are pretty well situated for siege warfare, which is essentially what the sanctions regime is, trying to close them off from the world economy. Uh, but the world economy needs their oil, it needs their gas, uh, and it's likely that they're going to find ways to get in the equipment and the technology that is currently being sanctioned, either through China, through Georgia, or through some of these other partners that are less, less obvious and less openly on the radar. And Keith, I know you've studied that area for a long time, so I wonder what you can tell us about Ukraine's history that would have predicted how this war has played out. Actually, in some ways, Ukraine's history would have led us to think that this war would have been that two-month successful victory for, for the Russians. So, you know, sort of Kiev and Moscow were part of the same country for uh, close to 300 years before 1991, and that country wasn't called Ukraine. It was called Russia so uh, or the Soviet Union. And so there's a lot of history of Russian control of this region. Uh, and there were close cultural and political ties to Russia, certainly before 2014. And so, you know, you could see why the Russians might think that this would go well, but, uh, you know, since 2014, and even during the Soviet Union, there was the development of a strong Ukrainian sense of national identity. Uh, the war in 2014 to the present has mobilized the Ukrainian population and made them more resilient, more willing to fight, and so I, I do think that we've learned that national identity can come late uh, and be very resilient uh, in cases like Ukraine. So we don't have to go back to Kiev and Rus to think about why the Ukrainians are resisting. A lot of it has to do with changes that they've made in the last 10 years. All right. Well, Keith, thanks so much for being on the program. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.